Legacy Precious Metals is the company that I trust to give you good and patient counsel for investing in your retirement. The Biden administration has caused a financial crisis and they have no clue how to fix it. Oil prices have skyrocketed and when oil prices go up, not only do your expenses go up, but the cost of transportation and shipping spikes, leading the prices of goods to rise. And when and we are already seeing record inflation. That's the last thing that we need. Our economy is in trouble and you need to take steps to protect yourself. If all your money is tied up in stocks, bonds, and traditional markets, you may be vulnerable. So gold is one of the very best ways to protect your retirement. No matter what happens, you own your own gold. It's real, it's physical, and it's always been valuable since the dawn of time. Call Legacy Precious Metals today at 866-528-1903 or visit them online at LegacyPMInvestments.com. That's LegacyPMInvestments.com where you can download the free investor's guide. You can also go to my Facebook page, Jenna Ellis. I am a public figure on Facebook and I just posted yesterday a really great interview with the president of Legacy Precious Metals who is discussing why you need to start your retirement account even if you're in your your 20s or 30s. There is always a great time to protect your retirement and invest just like you want to protect your health over the long term. So go to Legacy Precious Metals at LegacyPMInvestments.com or call 866-528-1903. All right, well, 2022 is going to be a critical year for America. AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens, along with their nearly 2 million members. The fight to stop out of control spending in the president's Build Back Better scheme is far from over, and Congress is plotting more legislation that could hurt our seniors. The midterm elections will be a battle for freedom versus socialism. Unlike liberal groups, AMAC is America's conservative, action-oriented 50-plus organization fighting hard every day here in Washington and across the nation for our seniors. So I'm urging you to choose AMAC now. You will receive all of the great membership benefits, including AMAC discounts on hotels, travels, and restaurants, and your membership will support your conservative values. So go to amac.us forward slash Ellis. That's amac.us forward slash E-L-L-I-S to become an AMAC member now. As a constitutional law attorney, former senior legal advisor and personal counsel to President Donald J. Trump, Jenna Ellis believes in the rule of law and the importance of integrity in our elections. And she's Hello, ready Hello, friends, to and welcome to another episode of the Jenna Ellis Show. I'm Jenna Ellis, and today America. we're going to dive right in to all things Trump raid, because uh, last week there was a great article in the Epic Times. If you're not subscribed to the Epic Times, by the way, you really need to. I think they're one of the best sources uh, for independent journalism right now that have uh, really covered a lot of great things like uh, what's actually going on with uh, the COVID vaccine. Uh, they don't shy away from that. They certainly aren't shying away from opinions as well on the Trump raid, which is why I have uh, my friend Lord Conrad Black, who is a historian, columnist, uh, justice reform advocate, and the author of the fantastic book, A President Like No Other, Donald J. Trump. And so uh, he wrote this great piece in Epic Times last week that is titled Anti-Trump Legal Expert Reveals Real Motives in Mar-a-Lago Case, and It's a Dynamic Story. So uh, Conrad Black, thank you so much for joining me today. A pleasure to be with you, Jenna. Thanks for asking me. Yeah, thank you. And I've been following you, you know, for a long time. And of course, uh, this piece here, I want to, I want to get into it. I think we all know, even from the headline, if anyone is, follows uh, all of the different legal experts out there, uh, we, I, I, I actually pinpointed and could have guessed you were talking about Andy McCarthy. So, uh, what's the premise here of your article? Uh, well. It, it, I don't have it immediately in front of me, but as I recall it, as you know, and you write these things every week for a couple of three different places, you can tend to confuse them. But that's not the problem here. I think I remember it quite clearly. And the two main points that I made were, or tried to make, were that um, uh, Andy, who, who I, whom I know and respect, he's a good man, but he, he's, he's an ex-prosecutor, and he's one of these ex-prosecutors who 
who, you know, you can't take the prosecutor out of the man, you know, and he's always sort of partial to the prosecution, sometimes in a way that is very uh, unbalanced, and, and particularly so in that he's that one of that large group of people that is quite antagonistic to the ex-president. So you put these two things together, and you get a highly intelligent person who occasionally says or writes things that are very unrigorous. And in this case, the two points that I, that I deduced were that, first of all, he um, uh, patched together a very shabby and implausible claim that, that there was a, a real... Uh, not only a basis to indict the ex-president, but uh, to uh, to convict him fairly, that he clearly had violated what amounted to criminal statutes, but he was extremely vague in saying what they were. And so I thought it was, a, 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 for him especially, because he is a, a very capable lawyer and legal analyst, uh, a, a really astonishingly shabby bit of explanation for a legal position. Uh, and because I agree with Alan Dershowitz's summary, who of course is uh, an even more eminent legal scholar, who says there's absolutely nothing to this. And I can't, I mean, I'm, heaven protect anyone who takes their legal advice from me, though I am technically a lawyer. I haven't tried to practice in over 50 years, but, uh, you know, I can, I can read a proper legal case and, and uh, even when it's journalistically presented, and I don't see what the complaint is here. And I think it's quite clear from the constant change and the flow of rumors and leaks that the DOJ indulges in that, that, that they have a pretty fuzzy view of it themselves. But the more important, the second and most important thing I thought in Andy's piece was near the end of it when he, when he said that it was a difficult call for the uh, Justice Department and the, and the powers that be in the administration whether to indict Trump because um, he is the candidate that they would most like to run against, and that might knock him out as a candidate. Uh, and I, I thought the, the, the takeaway on that one, and of course it's nonsense, all the polls show he would defeat the incumbent, and anyone who thinks that Trump is easy to defeat, to defeat an election hasn't looked at the two elections he's run. Uh, but, but apart from that, it was an acknowledgement, an outright, implicit, completely unambiguous acknowledgement that this was a straight political question. It wasn't a judicial question or a law enforcement question. It was a straight question about the political best interests of the incumbent president and his party. And, uh, and, and, and as I thought, it completely obviated the the, all of the previous uh, uh, discussion in his column about the merits of the case, which was nonsense anyway. And, and so we, he sort of comes clean, a, a very respected, deservedly respected anti-Trump commentator, and certainly a very learned, experienced legal commentator, uh, that this is not really a legal question, straight political question, does it suit the political interest of the administration and the president in particular to indict Trump or does it not? Well, you know, that I need hardly say to you or your listeners is, is what the justice system is supposed to be and how it's supposed to function. But unfortunately, in this uh, very, it's a, a cliche to say polarized, but in any case, very antagonistic political time, that's what we're getting. We're getting a political justice department uh, doing things that are politically motivated and are, in fact, in many cases over the past five years, illegal, as we have seen. Yeah, so so well said. And to frame it as this is uh, really for them, it, it comes down to mm -hmm. the Justice Department uh, putting this as a legal, uh, rather than a legal question, it's a political question. That's exactly what's going on in New York with the Attorney General and Letitia James uh, just going after Donald Trump because he's a political opponent, uh, rather than the justice system and law enforcement actually looking at the law and trying to enforce it. And so this raises a couple of other points, and I and I think your um, your article is just so well put. And, and I agree with you that Andy McCarthy is a very well-respected um, attorney. His analysis is, is usually very good. I mean, he's one of the people that I read, uh, everything that he writes. But He's a um, nice guy, too. Yeah, he really is. Uh, but this, this also 
raises the important aspect that um, for people who are listening, who always ask, you know, where where should I go to, you know, find what's really going on, find, you know, things that aren't biased? Well, the byline is always important in a piece, because when you look at what Andy McCarthy writes, um, if it's something that is on a Supreme Court discussion, I'm going to actually take that with a much different view than what he analyzes and what he writes about Donald Trump, just knowing his own partisan perspective and also with the background of a former prosecutor versus someone like Alan Dershowitz. And so, you know, how do you tend to read some of these pieces when you look at someone like an Andy McCarthy that's writing in National Review versus you know, obvious bias from the New York Times versus uh, some of these other opinions from people that are known Trump supporters? Well, uh, like yourself, I have an automatic skepticism when I see a a source like New York Times, Washington Post, uh, and and the lefty, you know, the lefty websites like Politico and uh, Dispatch and so on. I saw an absolute shocker in dispatch this morning up on Real Clear Politics that just took for granted that uh, 2020 was a perfectly uh, uncontroversial, pristine election. You couldn't possibly raise a complaint about it and, and, and just assumed all sorts of negative things about Trump. I mean, if, if that's where they start from, there's not much point reading it. But uh, occasionally there's surprises, I must say. Occasionally those, all of those publications do or sites do produce things that are quite fair. I'm not looking for a a whitewash of anybody. I'm not a whitewasher of Trump myself, but, uh, but, uh, you know, I like you, I I like to, I like to see not the assumption of negative things, but if they are going to be uh, entered, I I want them entered in a way that makes them plausible, Uh, not just name calling to, to start off with. But um, you know, you 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 look at you look at the quality of the sites. If you look at the aggregators, like Real Clear Politics, and of course there are quite a few of them, but they generally try and balance things a bit. So you have you have a pro and an anti on most issues and most personalities. And uh, there are there are sites that are uh, that are generally fairly reliable to uh, and, and authors that are fairly reliable, like a, a man like Victor Davis Hanson, a very distinguished historian. He's a friend of mine. I have a podcast with him and Bill Bennett. And, uh, but he's always very fair in what he does and, 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 and what he says, and he always reasons it out for you. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, it, you know, it, it's like anything else, it's sort of caveat emptor. You've got, to be, you've got to be careful of the source before you take the content seriously. But, but even, I mean, I, I saw to my astonishment about... Um, Three weeks ago, a piece from the Washington Post, and I forget who wrote it, but it was a, it was a, an opinion piece, not a not a uh, you know a contributor, not I think a staff person, and and it was very fair and very reasonable, and and so you know I don't discard these things in advance just because of where they're published, but but any discerning reader has to be careful. I mean, in this, it, it's always been to some degree like this, but not in my recollection as constantly and severely, stridently one-sided as the media usually are now. And I, there's no farther you need to go to discover why public respect for the media has sunk to lows that are completely unheard of, as far as I know, since uh, since polling on this issue has been taken. Uh, I mean, when I was a young person, I hate to date myself, but people listened carefully to what prominent commentators like Walter Lippmann said. And, and they didn't always agree with him, obviously, but they listened to it carefully, read it carefully, read all of the major outlets, even ones they didn't agree with often, like the New York Times and Time and Newsweek magazine, read, read them all carefully. And, 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 and the whole process of public opinion formation was in a relatively few hands who, who didn't, in general, abuse their position. But but now we have, uh, I mean, after the 2016 election, you will recall that uh, the editor of the New York Times said that uh, it was no longer the function of the Times to publish all the news. It was the function of the Times to try and lead the readers in the direction they thought the country should be going. Well, you know, that's not why people buy the New York Times. They're not buying it to be led. They're buying it to be impartially informed. And that's not usually what happens on political matters. 
I mean, the Times is a fine newspaper discussing an election in Brazil or South Africa or something, but not in the United States. Mm. And that's so very well articulated. And uh, probably not a lot of my listeners know that um, my background and major was actually in uh, technical journalism. And so before going to law school, um, I went through uh, getting my bachelor's degree in journalism. And and I can remember uh, sitting there in, in the news and editorial classes with my professors articulating the distinctions and the differences between do you want to be an opinion and commentary writer or do you want to be a news reporter? Um, there's also you know public relations or different things, but then also um, going through the history of yellow journalism and, you know, things that are just um, so obviously propagandized that it's it's a shift from traditional and respectful journalism. And I agree with you that, um, you know, we there, it's always been that way uh, to an extent, but the the rise of the political fervor that has just taken over the country that we are so polarized that uh, people tend to now uh, not even look at a piece or read a piece or have their opinion uh, swayed at all if there is a publication that has an opinion or has um, even facts that come out that are contrary to their own preconceived idea. So it's almost like we're just looking for confirmation bias in our news sources instead of saying, let me approach this wanting my opinion to be informed so that I can have, therefore, an informed opinion. And so it's frustrating when uh, people who are good analysts otherwise uh, then tend to shade their opinion just based on uh, political connections. And of course, you know, we've had that um, to a certain extent with people who work for a campaign, for example. And, and of course, you know, they're always going to postulate things in the best interest of their candidate. Lawyers do the same thing for their clients. Uh, but that's always been presumed and assumed. But journalists are supposed to act differently. And so when when we take that whole concept and apply it to the argument that I think you brilliantly explain in your piece, um, there really is no argument for what the FBI is doing and the Department of Justice is doing to Donald Trump as a legal question, not a political question. And, and after... You, You've you've kind of gone through you know surmising um, Andy McCarthy's position and 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 certainly pointing out you know some of those issues. Um, going down to to the meat of the argument, I think that you brilliantly explain that uh, what is there that they're actually indicting him for because um, whether they're the documents are classified or not is not actually an issue. Uh, whether he had and possessed documents from his presidency is not an issue. And and we're talking about it being a legal issue, not a political issue. Yeah, and uh, as far as I can see, they're reduced to this spurious allegation that he's been recklessly subjecting confidential information, classified information, to uh, the danger of getting into wrong hands. I mean, this is a bit rich given that and to be fair, even Andy implied this. It's a bit rich given that Hillary Clinton dumped all kinds of classified material straight into the laps of the Kremlin and whoever else wanted it uh, in a way that was uh, uh, compounded by the destruction of 33,000 emails that were under subpoena and nothing happened. So uh, that that does, as Andy acknowledges, raise a question about the contrast in treatment of the two uh, of the two people but uh, it seems to me Jenna that there are two um, fact situations that are very prevalent right now that that we will eventually want to get to the bottom of and find out how they happened uh, and one is the absolutely irrational uh, extreme form of, of, of anti-Trumpism, the so-called Trump derangement syndrome. I mean, all manner of highly intelligent people whom we both know and would be well known to and well regarded by your, by your listeners, I speak very intelligently and civilly on all manner of subjects. And when the name Trump comes up, a, a, a trap door opens in their foreheads and a cuckoo bird flies out and they start babbling absolute nonsense, malicious, uh, venomous, 
vituperative nonsense. Uh, and and th this is a very peculiar thing. I mean, there have been lots of politicians, political leaders, and other people, very prominent personalities in the past who have been very controversial. I think of Mr. Nixon, for example, whom I knew quite well in his last five years, uh, and things had settled down by then, but there was a time when he excited a great deal of passion, but not like this. And and uh, and not people just completely inventing allegations to to level against him, um, and, and uh, you know I I think I think we'll want to know how that came about. And secondly, we have this extraordinary arrangement, which I did refer to in that piece as a kind of silent, sacred, spontaneous oath that the entire national political media, even relatively pro-Trump parts of it, like the News Corporation titles, the uh, maybe not the Post, but the Wall Street Journal and, and Fox News, they, they, they all sign on to this idea that there's no possible question about the authenticity of the result of the 2020 election. Now, everybody who looks into it at all knows there were millions of harvested ballots, a, a person with the knowledge of grade three arithmetic can see that if 50,000 votes flipped in Pennsylvania and any two of Arizona, Georgia, and Wisconsin, Trump would have won in the Electoral College. There are millions of harvested ballots out there where it was impossible to, and in any case, in most cases, no attempt to verify that the, the, the vote cast was actually cast by a real voter or, or, or the alleged voter. No verification of that. And you you can't just sit there and say there's no doubt about that election. It's one of those elections, and there have been a few of them in American history, where we don't know who really won if it had been if it had been uh, if the votes had been counted fairly. I mean, we know who won the election. There's nothing to be done about it now. but but to sit here two years later, en bloc, en masse, the entire media of the country saying that it's just a matter of fairness of elections and anyone who questions the validity of that result is disputing the fairness of elections. It is, it is a very unhealthy, unnatural, and, and in the sense I mean it, phenomenal thing. I mean, it's a, it's a unique phenomenon. It's like, it's like the famous book, The Madness of Crowds, you know, where they referred to the 17th century um, speculative bubble in, in the Netherlands about tulips, and people were paying the equivalent of $25,000 to buy a tulip. Well, that's what we've got to. We've, we've got to a sort of hysteria of, of enforced uniformity that you cannot question the authenticity of, of an election, the voting and vote counting process of which were quite clearly unconstitutional in some respects, and where the judiciary refused to consider any one of the 19 lawsuits that, that questioned or challenged the, the constitutionality of certain measures in those swing states. And, and you can't do that without being labeled an extremist trying to suppress fair elections and a lackey of uh, all manner of fascistic aspirations for the country. And this is, this is nonsense. It's just nonsense. And, and it's or, malignant nonsense. It's dangerous. Yeah, or, or in my case, you know, have, uh, the, 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 uh, attorney board of regulations, you know, attempt to come after me and my bar license just because, um, I questioned it on behalf of my, my then client. But to see how this has been so politicized and, and it's not just me. I mean, they have come after, uh, and Democrat led, uh, political action committees and and other just um, supposedly you know well-meaning activists um, have come after over 110 of the lawyers that were involved in uh, some of these challenges, asserting absolutely nothing other than uh, they questioned the outcome of the election and also had legal theories. And if that's the basis upon which to uh, sanction attorneys and have adverse action against them is that they represented a client or they questioned uh, whether or not the administration of an election was fair and constitutional and had legal theories. Well, then no one could ever uh, practice law again. Uh, that, that would never be fair. Or to say that, well, you know, later on, uh, these cases were all kicked out based on standing. Well, how often does that happen to so many other cases? And so, you know, as you talk about in the article, 
um, you know, quote, the airtight sacred oath of secrecy that the entire American national political media have spontaneously taken that the 2020 was an unquestionably fair presidential election is an astounding and possibly unprecedented act of mass denial of the obvious by a huge group of well-informed people, many of them of upright character and high intelligence, and perhaps someday it will adequately be explained. Um, and I thought that paragraph in particular was uh, was so good because what do you think it would take, Conrad, for us to actually be able to have these types of challenges in courts when when elections? I mean, election law isn't something new that just was manufactured in 2020 that no one has ever challenged the result of an election ever before. Um, but we're seeing that in mass, people are just being forced to accept this premise that this was unquestionably the most free and fair election ever. So what needs to change? Well, I, I, I guess uh, it could happen two ways. Uh, th- this whole era could subside. It could just fall behind us and, and, um, and in another time, say in 10 years or 20 years, if, um, if challenges arose, they'd be treated, they'd be treated fairly and seriously. Uh, you know, a kind of spontaneous uh, resurrection of the, of the respect for the institutions and the fairness that I think most people, most citizens, most people in the country want and would support, regardless of which uh, party they might be in, usually. Uh, but uh, the other way, I suppose, and this this is uh, this is the this is what is being struggled for at the moment is uh, the defeat of the current administration when it seeks re-election, and uh, and the serious re-examination of these issues by it would be hoped a, a non-partisan, highly respected panel. This will take some. I mean, I think you'd have to make it a, a, a respected judges, and you have to be careful with that. I mean, Merrick Garland was a respected judge until we all got a good look at him as Attorney General. Isn't uh, that amazing? Uh, I, I mean, I, I actually disagreed, not that my views count for anything, but with Senator McConnell not bringing his nomination to the Supreme Court to a vote. I, I thought he had a perfect right to vote it against it, but I thought he should have allowed it to be brought to a vote. Um, and, I mean, Chief Justice Marshall was the Chief Justice for 34 years, and he was put up by President John Adams after he'd been defeated by Jefferson and before Jefferson's inauguration. And he was a political enemy in Virginia of Jefferson. But but it went ahead, and Jefferson didn't complain about it. Uh, but but um, but that you know that's a, that's a, that's a sideshow. I mean, I th- I think if the Republicans win, and instead of uh, just returning the the hammer and tongs animosity that they've received from the Democrats. Uh, I mean, the, the, the manner in which the Democrats have abused their majority in both houses of the Congress to torment the Republicans is a complete outrage. And this fatuous January 6th committee where the Speaker Pelosi kicked the nominated Republicans off is an example of it. I mean, the chief Republican being someone who lost her contest for renomination in her district, the entire state of Wyoming, by 40%. Uh, I, I mean, the, that's representing the Republican Party. I mean, it's just a mockery. But but if the Republicans do a, do a proper job, a fair job of getting to the bottom of what happened, I think everyone would be grateful for it. Absolutely. And I think a lot of um, well-meaning Americans and not these people who just are so saturated in the game of politicking, but Americans who really want to see our nation thriving and may have different uh, political opinions on policy and politics that can have thriving, robust, well-meaning debate. Um, That's always been uh, the case in America that we've had a diversity of opinions. But uh, but the, the regular American people who don't want to see Washington just so concerned and myopically focused on their own party structure and and the interwarring between each other, 
Um, I wish that somehow all of these institutions that we're talking about, whether it's the media, Congress, the presidency, the judiciary, that they would stop being so focused on the political questions and they would actually start doing their job. Because if if they could actually see that, okay, we may be from different parties, but we all fundamentally serve the same <clears throat> supreme law and we are all under the mandate of the Declaration of Independence. The sole purpose of government is to preserve and protect uh, the rights of the people that our Declaration acknowledges are given by God, our Creator. I mean, we could we could come back to a thriving America, but it seems like our government is so incredibly politicized um, that. I mean, I, there are so many times, honestly, that you know, I'm here in D.C. and I'm so discouraged being just you know, a, a well-meaning lawyer from Colorado that had an opportunity to come in um, and work for the greatest president of my lifetime. And it's been an honor. Um, but to see the absolute dank corruption that exists in Washington, it's really discouraging. Um, do you That's think- shocking. I mean, there was always some of it, but it's, it's absolutely shocking the way it is now. I mean, the, the, the Democrats concluded that the only way to, um, to, draw public attention at the approach of the midterm elections away from the dismal record of this administration, which unfortunately has been, I mean, I'm not an American, so I don't want to be too uh, presumptuous, but uh, but I'm pro-American and I always hope that whoever the president is does well and the administration does well and the country flourishes. I mean, the whole Western world, all of the civilization, the democratic civilization we all share, all of it depends to a large degree on the United States functioning well and being governed by intelligent, capable people, and 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 so I, you know, I'm positive-minded. And every inauguration day, I personally, whoever it is and whatever party it is, I, I wish them well. Uh, but the fact is, this administration has been a complete failure in almost every field. Uh, and uh, the only success I can think of that they had it was uh, killing the Al Qaeda leader. But um, uh, and, you know, that was the armed forces. It wasn't the political actions of the Democratic Party or its leaders. But the, um, with, with that said, I mean, we, we have this position where Trump ran in 2016 basically against the bipartisan post-Reagan coalition. He ran, when you get right down to it, as much against the Bushes as he did against the Obamas and the Clintons. Uh, and and the the entire establishment of both parties locked arms. The never Trumpers are a minority of Republicans, but they're a majority of the Washington Republicans, as you would know. And they locked arms with the Democrats, and it was just a sandbag job. And they did everything they could to destroy his presidency, and they've not paid a price for it. And uh, and and they they clearly thought they had destroyed it when they managed to get Biden inaugurated. But when it came back to their minds that Trump wasn't dead yet and was in fact leading the polls, uh, they, they shifted, they tried to shift the argument, as I started out to say a moment ago, from an assessment of the president to f frightening the people with the specter of supposed Trump extre extremism. Why, Trump wasn't an extremist. I mean, what are they talking about? You know, there, there was no hint of racism as had been alleged or sexism as had been alleged or any of that. And as you say, he was a very effective president. If you even like him or not, that's fair comment. But to say it was extremism, to say making America great again is an extreme or fascistic idea, is 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 simply Orwellian newspeak. It's just rubbish. It's it's malicious lies. And and I mean, clearly, I, I, clearly is overstating it. But it seems to me that 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 farce that ludicrous escapade at uh, at the president ex president's house in in palm beach was an attempt to get the sort of trump chaos out there the chaos of the national political media and the democrats scurrilously endlessly at the top of their lungs attacking trump and that wearing down, causing an attrition in the voters, so they so they get to think, look, if only Trump wasn't there, it would all be better and less irritating. And up to a point, that started to work, and it, it enabled the president to retrieve some of the lost ground in the polls. But then it seems to me the, the Trump legal group 
uh, outsmarted them by getting the whole thing shunted off to a siding with this special master issue that shut it all down. And now the Democrats are going to have to face the electorate on the basis of their performance controlling the White House and both houses of the Congress. And to take a famous line from the Bible, they will be weighed in the balance and they will be found wanting. Indeed. And even Jen Psaki said on MSNBC the other day that if uh, the midterm election is a referendum on Joe Biden's presidency, then the Democrats will lose, which was um, probably the only fair and accurate thing that she's possibly said on uh, on national television. Well, she's but- working for a new employer now. She's working for NBC. So she's calling it as she sees it. I, I was impressed that she did that. I, I actually was too. And, you know, and speaking of fair comment, I mean, while obviously we, we both uh, love and respect and appreciate what Donald Trump has done for America and this country, I mean, in terms of fair comment on um, on his own actions, I mean, you even talk about in your piece how, um, you know, he saw th- the issues and foresaw some of the issues like the ballot harvesting and so forth in 2020. But as I've repeatedly said as well, even um, being then a member of the legal team and working for him, um, I have said as well, that um, you know, there was a massive failure on the part of the internal campaign lawyers as well as the RNC to address those issues up front. They did nothing to stop uh, the, the likes of Mark Elias. And you know they just thought that, oh, we'll so overwhelm the polls, it just really won't even matter. Um, one of my colleagues even said on a panel of election integrity at um, the CPAC 2020, and so this was right before the shutdowns and the pandemic, that said, you know, well, all of this discussion of election integrity, it won't even matter because we're going to so overwhelm the polls and everyone will vote and this president's so loved, it just, it won't even matter, which was a terrible, terrible mistake. Now, and this is what the polls were showing. I mean, most of those polls are connected to left-wing media outlets or left-wing universities, but the, the reliable ones like Rasmussen and Trafalgar were not saying that. They were saying it was close. But 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 not not that Trump is going to win a landslide. If he if he'd had a landslide, they, their calculation would have been right. All the fiddling around wouldn't have worked. But uh, but but they didn't have a landslide. Right. And and they should have, I mean, like good lawyers to anticipate issues and still, you know, whether or not it was the outcome of the 2020 election, but even to make sure that uh, the uh, that election integrity was preserved. And, and I think that's a fair um, statement that so many people are myopically focused on the 2020 election where precedent matters. And um, you know, and, th- and this just gets back into uh, the the Supreme Court. I was shocked that they refused to take up the Texas versus Pennsylvania case. Um, well, they- it, well, it was shocking. I mean, there were nineteen. John Eastman wrote a very good piece about this, but there were nineteen cases challenging the constitutionality issues, and and and, uh, and the judiciary refused to hear any one of them on their merits. Not just not just the Supreme Court. It, in the in the Texas Attorney General's case, supported by eighteen other states, but but uh, you know in Wisconsin the the Supreme Court of the state uh, af- after weeks had gone by said they had to start all over again at the lowest court. I mean they just won't hear it now. The the judiciary I understand that if you if they'd overturned the ostensible result, it would have been an immense controversy and there would have been perhaps irresistible agitation for expanding the Supreme Court and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, I mean, I understand that, but they aren't, you know, they are paid to be jurists and not politicians. Uh, in, in fairness, though, I, I think we can say historically, uh, there has never been a disposition to overturn a presidential election. You were right, certainly in what you said earlier on about elections being judicially reviewed if they're, if they're at, at lower levels. But for the president and vice president, the only time it was attempted was in 2000. And effectively, the U.S. Supreme Court, with dissent, said that, you know, that they, they couldn't conform to the deadlines. There was nothing for it. And the ostensible result was the one they had to go with. Um, Mr. Nixon could have challenged in 1960 for, for all the funny business that went on in various places. Uh, and there, I think there were 13 states where it was within 2%, but the key ones were Texas and Illinois. But, um, and President Eisenhower said, don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll support this. You know, we'll, 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 we'll give you the money you need, meaning his rich friends would. But Mr. Nixon, patriot as he was, uh, thought that would be bad for the country, and he didn't do it. 
but I mean, I think I think we have to live with the fact that a guardrail on one side of the system is the judiciary will not overturn a presidential election unless it's an absolutely egregious violation that's almost self-evident. Um, and, and I'm hoping that the guardrail on the other side is that the prosecution service will not spuriously indict former presidents or presidential candidates for political reasons. And that's what's being tested now. It is. You're 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 right. And I think it would have been so much better for the country and for the judiciary as a whole if these judges would have taken up some of these cases, even if they had said that and said, you know, listen, this is a political question. It is not the role of the judiciary or and fashioned a precedent and a principle that would have guided future election contests because I I think it put the country in such a bad position that you still have such an open question. And there are a lot of controversies and, uh, you know, and there were a lot of different theories as well that, uh, that you mentioned in your piece, there was a lot of distraction and other kind of, you know, dog and pony shows going on that distracted from some of the main arguments that were actually filed by the Trump legal team. And, If the Texas versus Pennsylvania case specifically had been taken up by the Supreme Court, even if they had said, this is the rule, this is what we think is within uh, our purview of the judiciary, that would have at least served to have a bright line guardrail rather than just an implicit and almost ignoring of, of where the country was at a moment of crisis. And I think that that was a very bad decision on their point on their part to say when you have a state suing another state which is clearly original jurisdiction under article 3 yeah. of the US constitution for them to simply ignore it because it was so political made it in fact political and there was a sort of semi dissent on that point from Alito but that's all no it was, it was you're right it was terribly disappointing but I, I accept their view that what their apparent opinion that that uh, Overturning an election result would be hugely controversial, but I, I also I agree with you. If they if they had a well argued reason for doing it and said, "Look here, all of these changes in these different states w- were were not contrary to the Constitution approved by the legislatures of the states, and they're not legal, and the results are therefore not receivable." Now, unfortunately, you have no procedure for for holding a second election in any part of the country. And and you would have gone. Th- I mean, even if they'd acted very quickly as they did in the in the Gore Bush case in 2000, it, it would have been hard to to organize, even if this was what the decision was, a new election. And it would have been rather severe to invalidate the elections in in as many as six states like that. But. Uh, but just doing nothing. And, uh, you know, Connor Black, you've been so generous with your time. I could talk to you for hours. I just, I love all of your commentary and um, your thoughts and you are so articulate on all of these things. And so um, thank you so much for joining me. My, my, my last question to you as well is where do we go from here? Because so many people that's, you know, they, they're interested in this, they're interested in um, not only our country, but also globally, um, we, we, where America is leading, where Western civilization is leading and going, and hopefully not being dismantled. And so, if there's one thing um, that you, one piece of advice that you could give to American voters, uh, what would it be? And also, what would your advice be to President Trump, who clearly is going to be running again in 2024? Uh with the, I, I hesitate to presume to advise the entire electorate of the United States, speaking of more than 200 million people, but um, the, the, most Americans, in my experience, despite all everything that's gone on, are proud of their country and their right to be. It is a great country. There are imperfections in it, and I think as an outsider, it is not altogether a bad thing that the old American mythos of uh, being a unique democracy in the world and so on has been re-examined. I mean, there are other democracies in the world, and one of the ironies of our times is that the world, and it must never cease to recognize and be grateful for this fact, as chiefly to the United States, the spread of democracy and the free enterprise system all over the world in my lifetime. 
Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, but the irony is that the United States at this moment is not as well functioning a democracy as many others. Uh, I mean, you don't have problems like this in Canada or Britain or Australia or Denmark or something, but that's not the point. We're all democracies. So I, 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 my advice would be, don't lose faith in the country or the system. It's a great country. It's the best system. And you're the great propagators of it. Just fine tune it. Just try and you know decide who your office holders are and require both parties to work together to repair whatever... Uh, imperfections there are in the system as best you can. I mean, all countries do it, and you've amended your own constitution often in, in, in that general motive. And, and let's get back to the business of, of rational self-government. Uh, and uh, if the people want to change from the bipartisan uh, elite that's governed in Washington since Reagan's time, they're entitled to it, and they shouldn't be resisted by recourse to illegalities. Uh, and as for the ex-president, who, who I do speak with occasionally, uh, I mean, I never presume to call him, but I occasionally hear from him. I've known him a long time. Um, I'm glad to hear that. I, I'm glad to hear that you and he still talk, and that's uh, fantastic. Yeah, he and, and I, I hear from his office. They read my stuff quite often, I think. But um, I, 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 I would urge him to run again, but I would urge him to do it a little differently and make a, 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 as much effort as he can to avoid those things, even though they're often amusing and are often justified, but those particular flourishes of his that enable his enemies to portray him mistakenly and often in, in a defamatory way uh, as an extremist, to... to to surprise his opponents by becoming a less vulnerable target without compromising at all in the policy message that, that he's giving uh, to the voters and particularly to his followers. He was in policy terms, as most people admit, an excellent president. And it was a very successful term despite unprecedented harassments and illegal harassments uh, by his opponents. And and I think if he gets a little bit Lincolnian and is a little more patient and less angry and good-humored, although it's, I don't wonder it's hard to do it after they've ransacked your wife's closets and things for no reason, uh, and, and, and you'll have you know, the former director of national intelligence telling the world that he's a Russian intelligence asset and things like that, I'm, I, I wouldn't myself not necessarily be able to follow my own advice and be good humored about it but try to try to be as little a target for the for the penchant of his enemies to portray him as an extremist pitch it to real policy questions where he's almost unassailable i mean for for, for the current white house press secretary to say they were replacing a broken immigration system is simply scandalous. She should have her mouth washed it with soap. But uh, it, it's, you know, try and take the high road as much as you can, and 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 he has a chance to be one of the great presidents of American history. Indeed, and we'll look forward to uh, twenty twenty four, and hopefully get this country uh, back on track. And uh, Conrad Black, I so appreciate your time. Everyone needs to follow him on social media, on Twitter at Conrad M. Black. Um, you can get his book, A President Like No Other, Donald J. Trump in stores and on Amazon. Also, your website is conradmblack.com. And thank you so much for your time. And I hope that you will come back uh, often and have these kinds of uh, discussions. I think um, my listeners have been thoroughly impressed and very well informed uh, by your analysis and opinions. And I sincerely Really appreciate your uh, your dedication to uh, this form of, of genuine intellectual conversation, and um, and I just I so love and respect you. So thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you so much, Jen. Uh, you're much too flattering, but that's you're no less appreciated for that. Be happy to do it again. Well, it's very true and very genuine. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Bye. 
Legacy Precious Metals is the company that I trust to give you good and patient counsel for investing in your retirement. The Biden administration has caused a financial crisis and they have no clue how to fix it. Oil prices have skyrocketed and when oil prices go up, not only do your expenses go up, but the cost of transportation and shipping spikes, leading the prices of goods to rise. And when and we are already seeing record inflation. That's the last thing that we need. Our economy is in trouble and you need to take steps to protect yourself. If all your money is tied up in stocks, bonds, and traditional markets, you may be vulnerable. So gold is one of the very best ways to protect your retirement. No matter what happens, you own your own gold. It's real, it's physical, and it's always been valuable since the dawn of time. Call Legacy Precious Metals today at 866-528-1903 or visit them online at LegacyPMInvestments.com. That's LegacyPMInvestments.com where you can download the free investor's guide. You can also go to my Facebook page, Jenna Ellis. I am a public figure on Facebook and I just posted yesterday a really great interview with the president of Legacy Precious Metals who is discussing why you need to start your retirement account even if you're in your your 20s or 30s. There is always a great time to protect your retirement and invest just like you want to protect your health over the long term. So go to Legacy Precious Metals at LegacyPMInvestments.com or call 866-528-1903. MyPillow is having their biggest sheet sale of the year. You all have helped build MyPillow into the amazing company that it is today. Now Mike Lindell, the inventor and CEO, wants to give back exclusively to you, his listeners. The Percale bed sheet set is available in a variety of colors and sizes, and they are all on sale. So for example, the queen size is regularly priced at $89.98, but is now only $39.98 with our listener promo code, Jenna, J-E-N-N-A. So order now because when they're gone, they're gone. The Percale bed sheets are breathable and have a cool and crisp feel. These come with a 10-year warranty and a 60-day money-back guarantee, so don't miss out on this incredible offer. There's a limited supply, so be sure to order now. You can call one 800 564 8475 and use the promo code Jenna or go to mypillow.com forward slash Jenna. You can click on the radio listener square and use the promo code Jenna. That's J E N N A. Thank you so much to all of Mike Lindell's listeners and listeners of this podcast for making sure to support MyPillow and using our exclusive listener promo code Jenna. That's J E N N A. 